My dear friends, uh, uh, welcome to St. Petersburg to Russia. Uh, to winter St. Petersburg, real winter St. Petersburg, we have a minus and uh, some snow. Um, it's a traditional main Russian Venus Forum we organized 13 years ago uh, in St. Petersburg uh, with the, our friends, with Boyaklov and Peter Neglen. Um, and today it's the main uh, Venus Forum in Russia and in all post-Soviet countries uh, space. Um, last year in our forum was uh, there were uh, eight hundred participants from different countries and of 35 countries. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, uh, this time, this COVID time, um, uh, limit our um, possibilities. But, but we organized the uh, hybrid meeting uh, 100 participants in Russia meet together here in St. Petersburg in our main hall uh, uh, in the historical part of St. Petersburg and we uh, organized the online meeting uh, with the leaders of phlebology from different countries. We'll come to St. Petersburg and uh, I would like to start our online conference. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure, uh, Professor Shadikov, to uh, help uh, allow me to engage in the international session and invite our esteemed colleagues from throughout the world for the session. As you said, St. Petersburg meeting, uh, the Venus Forum there is an excellent meeting. I've always enjoyed it. There's a lot of inter-exchange of ideas. And so let's uh, not um, delay and start the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Professor Shadykov. Thank you all. Um, and let's start our first presentation. Uh, Loyal. Actually, I would like to have uh, Dr. Gasparis and Alexei Forkin uh, basically say some opening comments as well as there are honored guests. Tony? Hello everybody from uh, New York. Um, I would love to be in St. Petersburg, never been there. Lowell has said that it's a beautiful place to visit. Um, obviously we live in a different world now and uh, talking into a computer at five in the morning is not my idea of uh, having fun uh, going to a meeting, but uh, it will have to do for now. Um, it doesn't prevent us, though, from interacting and sharing um, education um, in the world and uh, interacting to progress the ideas of venous disease uh, and treatment. Thank you, Lo, for the invitation, and thank you, Dr. Shedikov, for the invitation as well. Professor Falcon, two words. Uh, nice to meet you, dear colleagues. It is very pleasure to welcome you in St. Petersburg at uh, Christmas Phlebologic Forum. Thank you very much uh, for all for participation, and let's get started our forum. Thank you. And the last words by Professor Yoa from Colombia. Dr. Kabnik, thank you very much. Professor Shadikov, Professor Kabnik, Kabnik instead of doctor, and Dr. and Professor Fulkin, thank you very much for the kind invitation. Tony, you mentioned that you have never been in St. Petersburg. By this time of the year, you don't know how beautiful it is and the taste of vodka. It's completely different there than it is in here or in any other place in the world. I am missing uh, the opportunity of being physically there, but definitely that's something that it's gonna happen in the next uh, year or so, we will have the opportunity to be there. Thank you for having us here, and I declare this international session in the name of uh, the International Venus Forum and the American Venus Forum open. 
Well, thank you very much for all of those comments. And I will take the opportunity to start and I will be talking about EHID guidelines, recommendations from the American Venus Forum and Society of Vascular Surgery. So thank you, uh, Professor Shayukov, for the privilege. EHID guidelines and recommendations from the American Venus Forum and Society of Vascular Surgery was a major undertaking. So let's go right into it. I have uh, no conflicts of interest with this talk. Early adopters noticed that there was a unique complication with thermal ablation, thrombus extension into the deep system. The company Venus Medical was keeping a registry of which we mined and reported in 2002, 286 limbs with a 1% incidence of thrombus extension. In 2004, Anil Hingarani and Enrico Asher at the American Venus Forum cautioned all of us by reporting their early experience, 73 limbs with a 16% DVT rate. In 2006, I presented at the American Venus Forum the classification and definition of EHIT. After analyzing many cases from three different institutions, it was certain that there were different patterns of extension. EHIT 1, venous thrombosis to the superficial deep junction, saphenofemoral junction, or the saphenopopliteal junction, not extending into the deep system. EHIT 2, into the deep venous system, non-occlusive thrombus with a cross-sectional diameter of less than 50%. EHIT 3, into the deep venous system, non-occlusive thrombus, cross-sectional diameter of greater than 50%. And lastly, EHIT 4, total occlusion of the involved vein. With regard to EHIT treatment, all of us have our own thoughts. Thus, it was clear to the American Venus Forum that there was a need to develop practice EHIT guidelines. The AVF Guidelines Committee organized an EHIT writing group to analyze available literature regarding EHIT, to gauge the quality of clinical evidence, and to provide guidance on EHIT's diagnosis and treatment. These guidelines were approved by both the American Venus Forum and the Society for Vascular Surgery and accepted for publication in JVS, VNL, and the Journal of Phlebology. Regarding methodology, there were four subgroups tasked to accomplish the following. One, establish the EHIT definition. Two, to discuss the available EHIT classification systems. Three, evaluate prevention strategies and its risk factors and four, to appraise treatment options. We utilized four scientific repositories to identify potential publications related to EHIT, PubMed, Embase, Cochrane, and Web of Sciences. In addition, the following search terms were utilized, EHIT in patients undergoing radiofrequency ablation or laser venous ablation, DVT and SVT, superficial venous thrombosis prior to 2006, truncal veins, GSV, small saphenous, and accessory saphenous veins. However, perforated veins were excluded. There was no restriction regarding language or research design. The grade system was utilized. We looked at both Kabnick and Lawrence classification and were able to translate the data as the descriptors are quite similar. Thus, the AVF updated the EHIT classification by adding to EHIT 1, thrombus without propagation into the deep vein. We added the following, 1A, peripheral to the superficial epigastric vein, and 1B, central to the superficial epigastric vein, up to and including the deep vein junction. Now let's talk about EHIT guidelines. There are 15 guidelines with regards to EHIT. With a time limitation for this talk, I've selected some, but not all. So let's start off with guideline 2.1, risk factors for EHIT. Some possible but inconsistent predictors or risk factors for EHIT include large great saphenous vein diameter, previous history of venous thromboembolic disease, and male sex. These may be considered in the pre-procedural phase, but the evidence is inconsistent, grade 2C. Guideline 2.2, prevention of EHIT with chemical prophylaxis. 
The use of chemical prophylaxis for prevention of EHID should be tailored to the patient after an assessment of risks, benefits, and alternatives. Grade 2C. Guideline 2.4, prevention of EHIT by increasing ablation distance. There is a trend toward decreased EHIT when ablation is initiated greater than 2.5 centimeters from the saphenofemoral uh, great saphenous vein or saphenopopliteal small saphenous junction, grade 2C. Guideline 3.2, treatment for EHIT 1. Just as you would think, we suggest no treatment or surveillance. Grade 2C. Guideline 3.3, treatment for EHIT 2. We suggest no further treatment of EHIT 2, but weekly surveillance until resolution of the thrombus retraction. Grade 2C. However, as an alternative for EHIT 2, consideration may be given for antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulation for EHIT 2, weekly surveillance with cessation of treatment following thrombus retraction to the saphenofemoral junction, grade 2C. Guideline 3.4, treatment for EHIT-3. We suggest treatment with anticoagulation for EHIT-3, weekly surveillance and cessation of treatment following thrombus retraction to the saphenofemoral junction, grade 1B. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, guidelines 3.5, treatment for EHIT-4. We suggest that treatment should be individualized considering the patient risk factors, bleeding risk, and reference may be made to the CHESS guidelines for the treatment of a provoked VTE, grade 1A. So again, I'd like to thank the Society for the honor of presenting the new EHIT guidelines from the American Venus Forum and the Society of Vascular Surgery. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Kabnet, and I think you can hear uh, all the, the audience applauding your presentation. Uh, and thank you for the kind invitation, of course, Professor Kabnet and Professor Shadakov, and congratulations um, for such distinguished guidelines publications, uh, Noel. Brilliant presentations as always. Uh, I have just two short questions. Um, the first one about um, the incidence of heat, did a heat incidence differ with the evolution of laser catheter itself from bare tip laser fiber to the rigid fiber with such a different wavelengths and different ways of conduction of energy and firing? And my second question concerning the guideline number 2.2, the chemical prophylaxis for prevention of e-heat should be tailored to the patient after an assessment for risks. My question here is being in such a scary pandemic with compound thrombogenic insults. Do you recommend to look for such a thrombogenic risk in the current situation for your patient prior thermal ablation? And thank you so much, Lord. Pasiba. As, as always, your questions are always thought provoking and they're not very easy questions to answer in one minute, but I'm going to give you a, a very short answer. There's been no combined randomized trial between the radial fiber and the forward firing fiber. So the incidence of EHIT has not been compared. There is some evidence that going forward that lasing at ground zero with a radial fiber may, uh, may be beneficial for uh, recurrence of things like the anterior saphenous, but I'm not sure that we've done a head-to-head -head trial looking for EHIT. Besides the majority of e-hits, which are two, as far as I'm concerned, are really not a clinical problem because most of those disappear within 14 to 21 days. And that's why I'm a big proponent of no treatment, just surveillance. With regard to the current situation and COVID, um, I think these are elective procedures. So one of the things that we must look at is the stratification and the risk forward of going to do these procedures, but the majority of these are done ambulatory. So unless you have a significant risk, unless you have had COVID in the past, those may be things that you want to stratify. And after talking to Dr. Caprini, we agreed that we might want to put the risk of COVID as a risk factor. So thank you for your questions and appreciate it. Thank you, Noel. Thank you. 
dear uh, colleagues. My pleasure to introduce uh, the discutant from Russia, Denis Borsuk from Chelyabinsk. Dear colleagues, uh, let me ask you from the audience. Uh, oh, Lola, sorry, <laughs> can I ask you? Uh, and, um, in all of your documents, you never uh, take a length of the thrombus into account. I mean that we can have second class a hit with length of uh, 12 centimeters, and it will be more dangerous than uh, free class uh, e hit and uh, three centimeters. Uh, so, do you think we need to subscribe somehow this situation in the guidelines? So, you raise a very interesting um, question. So, with propagation of that length, we would be concerned with a significant pulmonary embolism. And I think that's a little bit of a different treatment. But in reality, the amount of times that we see that type of extension, I've never seen it. But I know that you have. And uh, we look forward to discussing this in the future. Thank you for that question. With that being said, I'm going to move on to the next presentation, and that will be from um, our esteemed colleague, uh, um, Jorge Ioa, Professor Jorge Ioa, talking about the old and new Venus drugs, evidence-based. Thank you, Lowell. Can you see my screen? We do. All right, so my, my talk today is going to be in this morning here, afternoon over there, about what's new pharmacological treatment for chronic venous insufficiency. This talk is made under my uh, presidency of the Colombian Association for Vascular Surgery and my hospital and my university. It has been one year since the last time that I was with you guys over there and I enjoy very much to be with you sharing the cold and warm of that beautiful city that is hosting today's St. Petersburg Venus Forum International Session. Uh, the old things that we can offer in those five minutes, I have to talk about the options, surgical, not, not surgical, but uh, pharmacological options for our patients. It has been a long, of stuff that has been applied and used during the history of mankind for the treatment of ulcers and venous diseases. My, my talk today is going to focus into the new things. What is new and what is the things that has evidence, scientific evidence that is uh, forcing us to uh, prescribe something that has the support from the literature. And we, we published something that we find two years ago, the option of having um, the, when, when you go and see the C6 patients, that's a peak that is showed up for men. And when you go and see what is happening with women, it's C1. So we have the two spectrums of the SIP classification in the two genders, one in the right and the one in the left. If we begin treating the patient with venoactive drugs, we see a decrease by 53% in the report of symptoms when we start treating in the first visit and the second visit, maybe four weeks after the, the, the initiation of the treatment. Patients, of course, they are much more prone to the use of drugs and fast surgical options than lifestyle modifications. And uh, Kirienko and other collaborators from that side of the world has presented that after eight weeks of treatment, there is a dramatic reduction, at least when we treat the patients with MPFF 1,000 milligrams once a day. There is a lot of discussion about if we can apply once or twice a day, but I uh, strongly report that the, the option of just treating in the morning with 1,000 milligrams is more than enough. The literature has been uh, presented in a couple years ago by Kakos and Nicolaitis in a strong evidence for MPFF followed by Ruscus, oxyrudins, and calcium dobesylate. 
Uh, MPFF is the one that has the more uh, supportive evidence in the reduction of pain, heaviness, feeling swelling, cramps, fatigue, burning sensation, etc. And there is a good news, something that has showed up and called my attention. It's when we are treating not only truncular veins, but when we are treating uh, telangiectasis and C1S patients, there is from that part of the world, from your country, a, a fantastic paper from Stoico that uh, proves that the use of diosmin 600 milligrams a day once in the morning, it's more than enough to uh, report or to, to decrease the sensation of pain and improve the treatment of regular telangic tissues treated by, by sclerotherapy and laser, transcutaneous laser. Of course, we are the plumbers of the health system. We need to treat the patient with those fantastic drugs, but of course, we never have to forget that we need to do something surgical or minimally invasive to complete our process and our treatment. In my name and the name of my uh, team of my hospital, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have uh, one discutant today. Malay Patel is very busy, and I would like to introduce the Nesta Intiago from Ecuador. Please, Nesta. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the Congress of the Venus Forum. Thank you, Lowell. Uh, recent kind regards from the Pan American Society of Laboratory and Lymphology, Southfield. Congratulations, Dr. Ulloa. The bad active venous drugs has been used for many years to relieve the symptoms of the chronic venous disease. What is benefits has been demonstrated in the differing degrees of the seed classification. These benetonic drugs act by reducing the damage in the venous balls and visceral wall, as well as in the microcirculation, reducing the edema or promoting the lymphatic activity, especially the flavonoid, uh, ruscus, and calcium dobicillate. Two more drugs have appeared in therapeutic arsenals that are not bad such as pentoxifilin and sulodexide, with little evidence on being a stone, but on the erythrocytary, the formability and viscosity. Hot blood, and on the prevention of thrombosis with the sulodexide. In the current context in which we are facing a sad cox pandemic, do you think that it is important to add to the patient with venous insufficiency who had presented coronavirus. In addition to the monotherapy with active venous drugs, the pentoxifolin or sodoxide to diminish the endothelial damage and complication of the disease and not only to alleviate the venous symptoms. Thank you. Ernesto, thanks for the question. I, I have to say that uh, under the uh, light of COVID infection, uh, the only evidence that has been coming and going more than three times is the support that heparinization could do for that kind of particular uh, effect, Velcro effect that it's happening in the immunothrombosis in those cases, in those patients. I'm not sure if uh, any process of venoactives in any way can help that kind of patients. So I would probably recommend to wait for solid evidence to see if we can recommend the use of it or not. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Um, this was interesting in, in the US, we have not uh, advocated uh, a whole lot of 
phenotonic venous agents. And it's always interesting to hear what other countries are doing with these and perhaps we're lagging a little bit in terms of the use of these uh, venous drugs. Uh, with that being said, um, I am going to introduce our next speaker who needs no introduction, uh, Professor Parsi. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it with us, but he was nice enough to uh, do his uh, broadcast uh, video and he sent it to the Congress. So he's going to be talking about immune response to cyanoacrylate. We should expand the relative contraindications. So if we would play Professor Parsi talk. Thank you. Professor Shadokov and Dr. Kabnik, thank you for the invitation to present at St. Petersburg Venus Forum. Today I'm talking about the immune reactions to cyanoacrylate adhesive closure procedure. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Acrylates are plastic compounds commonly found in artificial nails, glues, eyelash adhesives, dental fillings, and printing materials. In medicine, cyanoacrylates are used as venous occlusive agents, embolic agents, and adhesive agents, and you're quite familiar with products such as Venaseal and Venoblock. N-butyl cyanoacrylate, or NBCA, is the active agent in the venous occlusive agents. It's important to note that the carboxyl ethyl group is the antigenic component in the molecule. The immune reactions to NBCA can be classified into immediate hypersensitivity, delayed type hypersensitivity, and granuloma formation. Immediate hypersensitivity is an IgE-mediated immune response. It occurs within seconds to minutes of exposure and can typically present with urticaria, angioedema, and anaphylaxis. Immediate hypersensitivity is not a common immune reaction to MBCA, but we have indirect as well as direct evidence that this can happen. For example, full body urticaria was reported in the WAVES trial. Up to this moment, there has been no reports of anaphylaxis to this product. Delayed hypersensitivity is a more common immune reaction to MBCA. It can be classified into irritant contact dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis. Irritant contact dermatitis is a non-allergic tissue response to irritants. Acrylates are well known to be one of the most common causes of skin reactions to most adhesive tapes and dressings but NBCA itself is a less reported cause of ICD. By contrast, allergic contact dermatitis is a type 4 T cell mediated immune response that can be detected within 48 to 72 hours of exposure. Acrylate allergy is actually quite common and extensively reported in beauticians and dental workers. Acrylates were called the contact allergen of the year in 2012. Allergic contact dermatitis, or ACD, typically presents with contact dermatitis in up to 90% of the patients, but can also present as a dyshydrotic eczema or pomphalix in about 10%. Allergic contact dermatitis is not commonly reported with MBCA and mostly reported with other acrylates, such as those found in artificial nails and tissue adhesives. How about allergic contact dermatitis following the cyanoacrylate adhesive closure procedure? The initial report referred to a phlebitis that happened in up to 20% of patients, a figure that was much higher than that quoted for EVLA and radiofrequency ablation. The patients presented with a nonspecific erythema, itch, and edema. This so-called phlebitis occurred at some sites that did not correspond to an actual vein and in some cases did not respond to anti-inflammatories. In one third of the cases, it occurred over untreated sites. Eventually, Park proposed that this is not phlebitis and is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. And since then, more and more reports are appearing in the literature where the patients have the same symptoms and signs but they show a positive patch test to venous seal. 
So it's quite obvious that a lot of earlier cases of the so-called phlebitis were in fact allergic contact dermatitis. The next most important immune reaction to cyanoacrylates is granuloma formation. Granulomas form within two months of the procedure. They may be seen simultaneous with allergic contact dermatitis, or they may be entirely asymptomatic. They can also progress to suppuration, necrosis, and ulceration. Granulomas can present with pain, edema, systemic symptoms such as chills, paniculitis, and induration. And as you can see in the ultrasound studies here, there is a massive edema surrounding the vein treated with MBCA. In this study published by our group, cavitated foreign body granulomas surrounding the glue were detected 12 months after the procedure with vena block in patients who were entirely asymptomatic. While our study was a histological study in asymptomatic patients, most of the case reports describe patients who are symptomatic with progressive symptoms and experiencing granuloma extrusion so that the treated veins had to be ultimately excised. So in summary, the immune reactions to MBCA can be classified into immediate hypersensitivity, which is not very common, delayed hypersensitivity, and in particular, allergic contact dermatitis, which is more common and confused with phlebitis and granuloma formation, which can be quite debilitating, requiring excision of the treated vein. So can we, or how do we test to detect these immune reactions? Prick testing, as you know, is used to detect type 1 immediate hypersensitivity. Acrylates are not part of the standard prick test panels, and there are no commercial prick tests available for MBCA. Patch testing detects delayed type T cell mediated hypersensitivity, and there are commercially available patch test series for acrylates, but these do not include MBCA either. So, can we do any testing? Well, the product itself can be used for prick or patch testing, but acrylate monomers in the liquid form are strong irritants and can cause ICD. And in addition, skin exposure to the usual treatment dose can cause ACD. Therefore, it's best to refer the patient to an immunologist or a contact dermatitis dermatologist for testing. And finally, do not forget to do a skin biopsy if you have an undiagnosed skin eruption and you suspect ACD or ICD, or if you have fat induration and you suspect paniculitis and granuloma formation. For the skin eruption, all you need to do is a four to six millimeter punch biopsy of the skin, but for fat induration and granulomas, you need an incisional biopsy to include the affected vein and the surrounding fat. Now we briefly describe the contraindications to cyanoacrylate adhesive closure as described by the Australasian College of Phlebology. Absolute contraindications included hypersensitivity to acrylate, previous significant complications to the procedure, acute VTE, acute or uncontrolled localized or systemic infections, active or uncontrolled systemic disease, and in particular mast cell disorders, and granulomatous disorders, and relative contraindications included obstetric, low body fat composition, increased risk of VTE, and systemic autoimmune disorders such as SLE. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, <coughs> Kurosh, for your lecture. It's very, very important in Russia and uh, in our countries uh, around Russia, because <clears throat> yesterday I report about uh, the new uh, form of Russian glue, cyanacrylate. It's a different than Medtronic and Turkish glue. Uh, the same results, but uh, more and more and more cheaper. It's the future of our phlebology. So it's very important questions we discuss. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce our discutants, uh, Nikolai Kori from Altai University from the Russia. Please, Nikolai. Siberia. I have uh, two questions. First, 
why obstetrics is only relative contraindication for glue? First question. Second question. There are many methods, uh, uh, many invasive methods uh, to treatment primary venous diseases, uh, such as glue, thermal ablation, sclerotherapy, and others. But what can you say about conventional surgery, uh, open surgery for treated uh, in, in, in venous surgery, and how many operations you performed in open, open conventional surgery? Thank you. Thank you very much, Nikolai. Unfortunately, uh, Kurosh uh, is absent online, and we will send uh, your real Siberian question to Kurosh, to Australia. Yes, of course. <laughs> I, I want to have an answer for, for my <laughs> yeah. question, especially uh, about pregnancy. Yes? Okay. Especially pregnancy. Why glue in pregnancy? Okay. And uh, I would like to introduce our friend from India, Ravul Jindal. Ah, his question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Karoj. It's a very nice presentation. And I think it's very important to differentiate uh, three methods uh, or three different forms of hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, my question to you is, uh, do, there are many glues available in the market. And do you find uh, any comparative studies or you have performed, is there in hypersensitivity reaction different to different glues? Why I'm asking you this question is because uh, we have been using uh, two glues, so one Turkish and Metronic uh, from last three years. So Metronic glue has just come to India six months back. And uh, luckily, up to now, we haven't found any uh, hypersensitivity reaction in our patients, and we are following all these patients very, very closely. But uh, there are publications reported, and maybe that we have done uh, still less number of cases uh, for finding the glue. So could be, is there a uh, procedural difference how you do it, uh, the glue, uh, that makes a difference? Is there a, a difference in the type of glue you are using? Uh, that makes a difference. So, uh, you know, is there any research or any articles or have we reached somewhere uh, in uh, reaching a conclusion that uh, there is a difference, uh, you know, uh, how the hypersensitivity reaction happens? So, Evgeny, if I could weigh in um, with poetic license, uh, I spoke to Professor Parsi, and the, your questions um, raised to Parsi are, are excellent questions. With the different types of glue, um, most of them are N-butyl. However, the Russian glue seems to be different, and there have been no head-to-head -head trials that I know of comparing the complications of glue. But what is surprising to me is that the number of people that are reporting these complications. And in the United States, uh, there's question is, did we look at glue in a perfunctory fashion and not look at it significantly with the fact of all these complications? So I, I think that we might want to revisit this. I do know in the United States that we are now uh, screening our patients to make sure that they don't have glue allergies, that they do not have some uh, previous hypersensitivity. But what uh, Professor Parsley said is that you can develop these and, and after a while, of, for example, if, you, if you're using cyanoacrylate to uh, ex use uh, false eyelashes or, or nail acrylics, that you can develop these allergies and you don't know it until you do it. And we know that there have been also reported cases of granulomas and extractions, and we hear about these horrific cases, but the majority of times doesn't seem to be that effective. But I think we should be looking at it, and it'd be interesting uh, for, for one comment from Professor Shaidikov to mention in this um, forum about the Russian glue, because it's not N-butyl, and whether they're seeing the same reactions. Professor Shadikov? 
Uh, it's, we, we, no, no, we don't have the, uh, we have only preliminary results and 48 patients in one clinic and about 50 patients in uh, one of the uh, clinic of uh, different city. Uh, so we report about it, no allergic reactions, no, um, we don't have, uh, I think, uh, loyal, uh, we, we need the, Father investigations in Russian glue, and uh, it's depend the um, of uh, their it's depend of the technical details. I think so. It's a <clears throat> and of course of the formula. It's, we, we, Russian glue. It's a new formula of the glue. It's no yes. It's not butyl. It's ethyl with the two additions. May I take the liberty of asking Professor Kursat with Turkish glue to make one quick comment? Yeah, certainly it's going to be quick. First of all, yes, we do see some allergic reactions with Turkish glue as well, but definitely it's not as high as reported, but when I see it, I don't know why possibly the ingredients is uh, slightly different. But definitely, it's less than American glue, and totally, it may be rely on the chemical characteristic of the glue, but definitely less than American glue. Thank you. So, um, for for time, I'm going to move right on to the next lecture, and that will be pelvic venous disorders: a new way of thinking and classification. Professor Neil Kanani from the United States, who has been instrumental in putting together groups of people and talking about pelvic disorders. Thank you, Neil. Good morning, and I just wanted to test my audio to make sure that you can hear me as I open up my slides. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for the invitation, Lowell and Dr. Shitikoff, for participating in the meeting. Um, I'm from New York, and uh, my only disclosure is I'm sorry we can't all be together um, in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg's where my maternal grandmother was born. And uh, she spoke very highly, uh, uh, having lived in New York for a, a large part of her life, of St. Petersburg always. So um, there, was, uh, there were a series of uh, uh, systematic reviews of the pelvic venous embolization literature that were published around 2017 that were very critical of the quality of the evidence that existed to support the treatments. Um, consequently, a research consensus panel was put together that was multidisciplinary and international to look at what the research priorities for um, pelvic venous disorders should be. Obviously, clinical trials were suggested because until that time, and actually still, uh, there are no comparison studies available. Everything that's available in the literature is just a uh, case series to, uh, to some extent. Um, but the um, recommendation of the panel was before starting trials, we need to develop the proper clinical tools. And what I mean by that is we need to develop a precise disease criteria that's analogous um, to other diseases that have evolved from a previous syndromic um, situation. And so the recommendation was to clean up the synd syndromic nomenclature that we depend on so much. And also to make sure that when we do report studies, we're talking about homogeneous patients. And there um, lies the role of a classification tool to make sure that um, we are, um, and let me just hide my pictures of everybody here, um, speaking not just of a collection of a variety of different issues, uh, but rather also uh, very specific uh, bins or groups of patients that we can compare um, very carefully in clinical trials. And finally, uh, a need to develop a patient meaningful clinical endpoint. Most of the studies to date utilized um, visual analog scores that don't capture the full extent or burden of the disease on patients. In terms of nomenclature, the idea here uh, promoted by the uh, international work group is to eliminate the syndromic names and utilize and embrace the term pelvic venous disorders. Pelvic venous disorders um, implies a variety of uh, pathophysiologies as well as a variety of clinical presentations that are all linked and interrelated, primarily because the venous beds that link the various conditions are very interconnected. And essentially what this term does is unify the conditions that lead to and result from pelvic venous hypertension. 
So I'm uh, going to move to the next topic, which is the new classification tool. And there was a um, consensus group that came together uh, and worked over the last two to three years to develop a tool that's going to be, or that is called the SVP tool, like s'il vous plaît, um, in, in uh, English and uh, some languages, obviously not going to work as well in Cyrillic, but uh, symptoms, varices, and pathophysiology. Um, it's uh, developed, as I said, by consensus. There were um, multiple people. The leader of this work group was Mark Meisner. There were 16 delegates from nine international societies that in involved both uh, gynecology and um, obstetrics, uh, I'm sorry, uh, and vas various vascular disciplines. It's a very patient-focused tool. Unlike SEEP, it focuses on symptoms. It also has the signs and uh, pathophysiology involved in it like SEEP, but it's very focused on symptoms. It, it like SEEP, exactly like SEEP, is a discriminated in instrument, so it shouldn't be used to look for responses to change after treatment, but it defines like SEEP homogeneous patient groups and ultimately, it should be required for all future clinical trials and publications, um, and probably in clinical practice will improve the precision of the ability of our uh, colleagues to communicate. Yeah. The draft of that paper has gone through peer review, and it was accepted this past week by the Journal of Vascular Surgery and Phlebology. You should see the online version in the next two to at most four weeks. Um, it's based on understanding the zones of the potential veins that are involved. Um, and so I want to just spend a moment talking about that. So if this is a schema of the body, here's zone one, zone two over the pelvis, and zone three over the transition between the pelvis and lower extremities. So zone one really reflects um, uh, symptoms and varices around the left renal vein, zone two, the ovarian iliac veins and the, all the pelvic venous plexes, and zone three, the pelvic origin extra pelvic varicose veins in the genitals of both sexes and in the upper thighs, primarily in women. The S and the V domains of the three domain symptoms, varices, pathophysiology, discriminative tool depend on the zonal anatomy. And we'll, I'll show you that later. The P part is actually a, a compound um, domain that has three components. It looks at anatomy, hemodynamics, and etiology, A, H, E. Uh, anatomy is defined by the segments involved. The hemodynamics are defined by whether it's reflux, obstruction, or a congenital problem. And then finally, the etiology, thrombotic or non-thrombotic. So a very simple way of um, trying to understand the scoring system is to use what we've developed as a scoring sheet. Um, and you basically choose one or many, so you could choose several items from the symptom score, from the varices score, and then from the pathophysiology. This looks very overwhelming uh, uh, at first, and I'm going to point out that like all classification systems that are precise, um, it will require you to use it for a while and read the paper and really understand it. But I'm gonna show you um, how it works. So essentially we will define the S domain um, with um, zero, one, two, or three, or some combination of that. The V domain will also be de defined by zero through three, and it reflects which zones are involved in the, in the patient that's, a, that's a, um, affected. And the, um, the pathophysiology score with the anatomy, hemodynamics, and etiology relates to each of the segments that are involved. So those are all, as a groups of three, chained together to the P. And it actually works very easy. I think it's a lot easier than SEEP, particularly when you have this scoring system here. Um, the anatomy uh, is based on a very simple list of abbreviations for vessels that are very intuitive, at least in English. Um, and uh, it, SEEP has moved in the same direction as well. The hemodynamics are R or O, and the um, Oops, and the etiology, thrombotic, non-thrombotic, and congenital with initials there. So I just want to go quickly with the remaining time through three examples of what has, three examples of a, of a group of patients that have been previous to, previously defined homogeneously in theory by the term uh, pelvic congestion syndrome. So these are all patients with pelvic pain and varices, but in this case, either formed by ovarian vein reflux, left common iliac vein uh, com uh, uh, compression, uh, and left renal vein compression. So if we use the scoring system, and here's an example of a patient with bilateral ovarian vein reflux, of course, we're only seeing um, one element of that. The pain 
is in the pelvic area, so it gets a P2, so you would put, or an S2 rather, so you would put a two here. Uh, the varices are in the pelvic area, um, so it gets a two because it's in zone two. And then the A, H, and E are concatenated so that we know that it's bilateral grade saphenous, or sorry, gonadal vein reflux, it's reflux, and it's non-thrombotic. Um, and so it's, it's as simple as that for that particular type of disease. Here we have a left um, common iliac vein compression and then there's reflux in uh, the internal iliac vein on this particular patient. So again, it's S2 because the symptoms are in uh, zone two. The varices are in zone two. You don't see them here, but they're beginning to fill. And then the left common iliac vein has obstruction, which is non-thrombotic and the left internal iliac vein has reflux and it's non-thrombotic. And then finally, the last example, um, here we have uh, a renal vein compression with collaterals around the left renal vein um, and left gonadal vein reflux filling gonadal, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, uterovaginal plexus varicosities. And so again, symptoms are in uh, zone two. Here we have varices around the renal bed and in the pelvis one and two. The left renal vein has obstruction, which is non-thrombotic. You can see this reads like it would if you were to describe it. And so it becomes very intuitive when you start to use it. And the left gonadal vein has reflux and it's non-thrombotic. So essentially what we have are this very heterogeneous bin, so to speak, of pelvic congestion syndrome. And I've defined three cases with very different uh, SVP scores that help us to be more precise in the way that we use it. Tony Gasparis, who's one of the panelists in this session, has developed a classifier that can be, that work on any smartphone. Um, essentially, you uh, put in where the varices are, you put in, um, sorry, where the symptoms are, you put in where the varices are, and then you get the output of the score. And this will be available uh, on all the app stores for free at some point soon. So to summarize, get rid of the syndromic names and let's start to be more specific about what we're talking about using the symptoms varices and pathophysiology classification tool, which is much more precise. Um, and we'll be able to communicate a lot better with ourselves, but also with our colleagues and other dif uh, disciplines who have been very cynical about our work in this area. And we're working on a disease specific tool that will come soon. And again, I'm sorry we can't all be together, um, uh, but uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the questions from my colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Neil. It's a very, very important question. Uh, we discuss about the pelvic venous disorders every time in St. Petersburg Venus Forum in Russia, and then a lot of questions and not uh, a lot of answers. Uh, it's, a, it's a quick sound of modern phlebology. Uh, uh, I would like my pleasure to introduce our discutants. Uh, the first one, Zaza, our friend from Georgia, Zaza Lazarashvili. Please, Zaza. Thank you, Evgeny. Thank you, Lowell, for the invitation uh, once more. And uh, thank you, Neil, uh, for this uh, very uh, good, uh, very timely presentation. Uh, it was uh, my pleasure to participate in uh, the, uh, the working group of preparing this uh, classification. Uh, and uh, I want to conclude that it's very elegant, relevant, and a very uh, precious tool. Uh, but my question, according to a clinical introduction of this uh, tool and uh, how uh, difficult uh, it will be to uh, introduce this tool, especially for uh, the uh, companies uh, who, with whom we're working for reimbursement of the procedures. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. I do appreciate your contributions to the project. It's, uh, it, you know, the, the, the ideas here are from many, many people. Um, I think the tool you know, like SEEP, it's going to take some time to get uh, incorporated, and we're trying very hard to um, uh, incorporate this very quickly so that we can make sure that all new literature includes it. You know, I think the big criticism of our of our current literature is it's very heterogeneous um, in terms of the patients that are included. 
um, and we're um, you know we're, we're we're criticized because the criteria for the patient entry into the various case series um, has been has varied from from uh, study to study, and so I think the precision uh, and um, applicability and ultimately uh, acceptance of any future um, uh, work that we do will will depend on our overcoming those those criticisms and I think this tool is uh, one of those components to to that but I think ultimately what we'll need to do is utilize tools like this um, a quality of life tool that will assess the impact of disease and start doing studies that are comparative studies where we have a, a treatment arm uh, and a control arm and uh, to, to, to show what the benefits are to the patients who have these particular problems. Thank you very much. And the uh, second discutant, uh, Pier Luigi from uh, Italy. Pier Luigi. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Lower and Eugenie, for invitation. And uh, congratulations, Need, for your very clear and the precise presentation. My question is, uh, what do you think about the role of non-invasive investigation in the evaluation of these patients, mainly ultrasound investigation? Because you present some uh, phlebography, but uh, we need to screen the patients and uh, we need a simple method to evaluate the patient before the treatment. Thank you. I, I lost a little bit of your comment, but I think what your question was is, what do you think about non-invasive evaluation for yes. patients prior to um, interventional treatment? And I'm a big supporter of that. And uh, a couple of questions came up in the chat about that as well. Um, I believe um, ultrasound is, a, is an outstanding uh, way to survey in a very inexpensive way patients who come in um, with uh, problems. But you know, one of the issues is we utilize ultrasound very liberally as vascular interventionalists to look for venous problems and to understand the hemodynamics. But what's not happening is that most of these patients are not presenting to vascular specialists. They're presenting to chronic pelvic pain specialists, most of whom are gynecologists. And they have for years looked past the veins that they often see, um, making the assumption that the veins have no relevance to the, to the pain problem. And so I think the major advance that I'm, I'm hoping to promote is to change that within the gynecologic community and have them, um, when they do ultrasounds, which they do fairly frequently on these chronic pelvic pain patients, to look for, measure, and consider um, the, the presence of the varicosities in the pelvis. And when they do find varicosities in the pelvis, to consider a referral to a vascular specialist to do a more detailed um, hemodynamic assessment of the problem to determine whether we think there's a relationship between the veins and the clinical condition the patient's presenting. So I'm a big supporter of ultrasound. Thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, for the, the discussion and thank you for the presentation. Neil, that was outstanding as always. Um, let's move on now to another classification by Professor Human Jolly, a new classification for venous obstruction. Thank you, Lowell. Uh, thank you, Professor Scheidako, for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. So I hope my presentation is now there. This is the needed topic, is the new classification of chronic venous obstruction. So of the PTS group of our venous stenting patients. So my disclosure. Um, I would like just to give you an example. I'm not changing our program from venous to aortic, but if we consider these two pathologies, at the left side, we see a triple A, at the right side, we see a tracheoabdominal aortic aneurysm. If I would um, public publish a study and I put those two pathologies, even they are from the same anatomic region, and then I will show you the results of the uh, endovascular therapy or open surgery of these two pathologies, you would say that doesn't make any sense to compare the results of a triple A treatment with results of tracheoabdominal aortic aneurysm. 
even same region, same pathology. So exactly the same problem we have here. These are just four illustrated pictures of patients' venous system with chronic venous obstruction. Please consider the gray zone as chronic venous obstruction. That means eight months, 10 months, 10 years after a DVT. So, and if we took just, if we take just out the left example with the right patient, and in the middle, I showed you the real venous map of these two kind pathologies. I hope you can see my pointer here. We have a, um, um, involvement of the left iliac tract, but very important, the common femoral vein is not involved. The deep femoral vein is totally free and the femoral vein is patent exactly as this illustration. And at the right side, the same pathology, we call it in our papers PTS, but deep femoral and femoral vein are both involved severely. So we cannot compare the results of these two pathologies. We have to stop to compare apple with oranges. This slide shows you results of stenting of PTS patients after, um, so uh, published by Olivia Hartung. That means there are no nibble patients, no compression patients. And just have a look on the primary patency. There are differences between, look, 30% and 84%. So, and even we go to the secondary patency rates, even all of them treated PTS patient, no nibble, we have something between 66 and 91. So what went wrong? I change it to another published systematic review of Williams. This is from 2020. And this is a table from this study. And just have a look, very important, all of these studies used dedicated venous stent. And if we have a look only of the results of PTS patients from these publications, you see something between 59 and 87 percent, so big differences. And if I go into detail and we show you results of Stephen Black from London and of Michael Lichtenberg from Arnsberg, both very well experienced and very big, big centers. So I think the technical aspect should be ruled out as this big difference. And therefore, very important, both used which is then the same dedicated stent and both in um, in same patients, excuse me. And you see the results, 59% versus 87%. So ladies and gentlemen, I think the problem is here. They included different parts, portions of different patients, but all of them, we are calling them now PTS. So the classification is based on anatomical extension and very important, the inflow. Um, we propose a simple practical classification. So, um, of course, additional involvement of IVC has an impact, but the impact regarding the inflow is very small. So we put it out of the classification and a cross-sectional luminal area reduction should be considered as clinically significant. So this is the classification. And excuse me, just go to the group one. This is a nivel group, a compression with perfect inflow. You can treat it in endovascular marrow probably in 20 minutes with nearly 100% patency. We go to group two, already post thrombotic changes in the iliac tract, but no involvement of the common femoral vein. There is no involvement below the ligament, perfect inflow, endovascular treatment, patency rates probably something around 90%. Now we go to the difficult groups. So group three involvement of common femoral vein, but both inflow veins are patent and the inflow should be considered as very good. We can treat this group in endovascular manner. We do not need any endophlebectomy. I think we should estimate the patency rate 
about 70%, 80%. Now we go to the real extensive disease, 4A, 4B, and 5. 4A are patients with involvement of the femoral vein. The deep femoral vein is patent, and 4B, vice versa. These patients, they need difficult endovascular treatments. In this patient, we should probably stand into the deep femoral vein or use the endophlebectomy as a combined or hybrid approach. In, in the uh, 4B group, we should stand somehow into the femoral vein or use the combined approach or hybrid approach with endophlebectomy. And the group five, there is a really severely impaired inflow. This group should be considered as contraindication for treatment or really in rare cases, probably with access PTS trial or dilation of the femoral vein or deep femoral vein. So we are now validating this classification. Luckily, thanks to all centers, as you can see here, we have now above 1,000 patients data from 2016 to end of 2019. We started already with validation. So this is just a preliminary look of the data with 485 of these patients and just go to the venous claudication. You see in group one, group two, less venous claudication. And the more we go to the right side, the more percentage of venous claudication and have a look on the patency rate in the group one, nearly 100% group two, 80% to 90%, group three, 70, 80, and then group 4A and group 4B worse. And five is, of course, below 50%. So the clinical impact of this classification is just to aid the scientific reporting comparison of results between studies will get easier. Comparison of stent outcomes, we cannot compare outcomes of dedicated venous stents with non-dedicated venous stents to ease the decision-making for indication and contraindication in our patients with post-thrombotic changes and chronic venous obstruction and support the therapeutic decisions, endo versus hybrid versus conservative. So the studies of these treatment uh, options could be comparable and duration of type of anticoagulation probably, and to predict the outcome easier and to talk in an honest way to our patients. If we are going to treat a group five, the patient should know that the patency rate, rate is not higher than 40 or 50%. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Very interesting presentation and uh, our discutants. Um, the first one, uh, Michael Lichtenberg from German. Uh, my pleasure to introduce him. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much also for the invitation to participate in this uh, great uh, webinar session here today. Human, this was a great presentation and I really appreciate your classification. And I think there are two important aspects here. First of all, is that you mentioned that the interventionalist now can predict better on outcome. And I totally agree on that, that we need a, a system which helps us to predict outcome. Um, especially class four and five, I think these are for the interventionists the most challenging um, situations. And I personally fully believe that these um, very challenging patients and scenarios should be performed in highly specified centers. This is like in the AAA treatment that not every uh, AAA or toroco abdominal um, orteric aneurysm, as you said, can be treated in every center. And I think this is one of one of the aspects here. The other aspects um, I really appreciate is that with the classification, it is now possible to really um, compare different studies as, as you showed. PTS is not PTS from just from an interventional standpoint, coming away from symptoms, we are talking just about interventional outcomes. And this is the most important modern aspect. And you showed the studies and um, it is very, very easy that um, you make the mistake that that apple is like that apple. 
And with such a classification, we now may have the chance to really sort out the individual outcomes. So I highly appreciate this classification and congr congratulations on that. My question for you, Human, would be how important is um, the Doppler evaluation or the non-invasive diagnostic approach before just relying on MRV, CTV, or also including Doppler? So how to bring this diagnostic approach together? Thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction and, and uh, contribution. I have to tell you, Michael really um, sent data of over 290 or something like this patients to us. Thank you, Yurt. Thank you, all uh, participating centers. Without you, it wouldn't be possible. Um, yes, the duplex, the impact of duplex is very, very, very high. The duplex, in my eyes, is the most important tool, diagnostic tool, and especially regarding this classification. So uh, with MRV, you know, we use in each of our chronic venous obstruction patients, MRV, Jerry O'Sullivan uses CTV. Of course, these are good tools. We combine them. But with a duplex and with a good duplexer in the same setting, somehow standardized setting in supine and upright position, you can visualize the anatomical extension of the pathology. You can measure the diameter. You can show in the femoral vein, deep femoral vein, common femoral vein, the narrowing, the reduction of the area, the diameter, and you also have a dy dynamic tool. So you can measure above the ostium of deep femoral vein, the inflow. So for us in our room in Aachen, with our Philips machine, with our duplexer, we measure in every patient the involved leg above the ostium of deep femoral vein and in contralateral vein, and somehow 200 milliliter per minute in this setting, again in this setting, is for us the really the limit above it we think the inflow could be considered as somehow enough but there is zero evidence but the impact of duplex is very high so i recommend to use duplex uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, the second uh, discutant it's uh, Shiram Niran from uh, Glen Eagles Hospital and Mount Elizabeth Hospital from Singapore. Please. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ravni. Um, I could just about lip read the Singapore, so I assume it meant me, uh, and because the sound wasn't coming through very well. Thanks, woman, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation, and I'm glad you brought in uh, the issue that duplex is key because we are doing a fair amount of work on inflow duplexes with, uh, with, with uh, uh, chronic venous outflow obstructions. My question to you really is, I understand that this classification genuinely gives us um, a degree of difficulty map uh, based on the anatomy and the stent patencies, um, but stent patency alone may not be the best outcome measure. Uh, um, but I saw during your presentation a suggestion that um, the classification allows decision making. My question is, it certainly may allow decision making for an interventionist to know, is he uh, ready to take this on and how difficult it is going to be for him? But is it right to say that this is uh, a tool for decision making on whether or not an intervention should be done. Because you can have, as you know, um, a, a grade 4A in your classification um, that may be relatively less symptomatic and less quality of life effect as compared to a patient uh, in, in grade 3 who might have a much greater uh, impairment of quality of life. So would this tool then come into play to do a risk benefit sort of assessment on, these are the risks of me trying to cannulate it, do you think that the benefit is worth it? Is that where this tool stands? Thank you, Siram, for really nice comment and question. Yes, it is very important what you now mentioned <clears throat> because of lack of time and my topic. 
I didn't went into detail of how we make our decision in our outpatient clinic. You're right. The first thing is I show it every time in my presentations, if the patient is symptomatic or not. We have group five, group 4A and 4B without any problems. And we have, you know, group two with totally impairment in his or her daily life. So that is the first point to consider if a patient should be considered for treatment or not. The second thing is after a DVT, if we, if we miss the first phase of treatment, let us say that was a proximal DVT, we still have to wait 10 months to 12 months to give the spontaneous recanalization a chance. This is the second thing we every time wait and reevaluate the patient after six months. The third thing is after we make the decision that the patient is really symptomatic and is Vilalta, VCSS, venous claudication, which is not represented in Vilalta, and of course the patient's daily life, then we go into the classification and see, look, what patient's symptoms are and what do we have to do? As Michael Lichtenberg mentioned, the 4A, 4B and 5 should really be uh, performed in patients with no chance anymore, with non-healing disorder or really uh, ulcers or really compare or impairing patient's life, not only with itching or somehow swelling. So that is the issue or the importance of the classification. I'm sorry that I didn't show it, but of course we are no, not going to make a decision I understood, it, I, classification. I understood it straight away that this is really a risk benefit analysis tool. Exactly. The risks are for the patient and for us trying to intervene and are the benefits of that complex and intervention worth it uh, for the patient. So and, it's so, really uh, and somehow to be able to compare our studies, as Michael uh, mentioned, stent versus stent, dedicated stents versus non-dedicated stent, endophlebectomy versus stenting into the deep femoral vein, we cannot compare. Yes. Anyway, thank you very much for, for the, the presentation and the discussion. So I'm going to move right on and introduce uh, Professor uh, Tony Gasparas who's the president-elect of the American Venus Forum, and he's gonna talk about treatment algorithm for combined superficial reflux and deep venous obstruction, something that we argue about all the time. Tony, uh, you might be on mute. Yep, sorry about that. <laughs> so I'll just move along. Um, These are my disclosures. So when we look at patients with uh, chronic venous disease, um, most of the patients uh, have superficial insufficiency, over 80%. Uh, then you have a small group of patients who have isolated deep venous disease. And then you have a subgroup that has about 10 to 15% of patients with combined superficial and deep pathology. Now, when you look at superficial disease treatment um, of uh, insufficiency in these patients, we know have uh, and expect to have good outcomes. Uh, but what about patients with combined disease? And what's the role, safety, and algorithm in treating these patients? When you look at uh, combined disease, uh, the pathology in the deep system can either be reflux or obstruction. Um, reflux is either segmental due to overflow of the uh, uh, superficial system, or uh, it could be axial. Now, most of this talk is going to concentrate on the deep obstruction, which again can be either post-thrombotic and non-thrombotic. Obstruction, uh, since the 90s, uh, was uh, in the 90s, uh, there was traditionally thought uh, to advise against the saphenous ablation in these patients, as the thinking was that this was a collateral system for the obstruction, and that the varices uh, acted as functional collaterals. Now, the concern was that uh, in these patients is that if you do get, eliminate this uh, collateral system, that functionally these patients will get worse. Uh, Labropolis in the 90s, late 90s, showed a hemodynamic evaluation of these patients, um, comparing those uh, with the previous deep vein thrombosis uh, and controls, and look at uh, quantify the functional venous outflow obstruction uh, with different location extent of obstruction. And what they found was that only about 10% of patients had a reduction 
in venous outflow by occluding the superficial veins. And therefore, the deep collateral seems to be more important um, than the superficial system. And the saphenous vein therefore plays an insignificant role in the majority of these patients uh, as far as being a collateral pathway. Um, so, and this more likely is from a clinical perspective, seeing some of these patients, you can have varices in large uh, superficial veins, but no reflux in them. Um, and that's probably the subgroup of that 9.6% of patients that would actually get worse. And that's usually a result of the fact that the deep system can, has not developed a, a deep collaterals. How about treating these patients? Well, Raju showed um, in, in the late 90s, again, comparing patients with obstruction and no obstruction um, undergoing um, um, saphenectomy, and it was shown that they tolerated this very well. There was no difference in outcomes, and that patients were not made worse clinically. And therefore, saphenous ablation was concluded to be uh, performed safely in these patients with deep venous obstruction. Um, is there a higher risk of thrombotic complications in, in treating these patients? Um, Pugioni in 2009 uh, looked at a, sub, a, a group of patients who underwent ablation. Uh, about 29 of these patients had a previous history of DVT or duplex findings of uh, post-thrombotic changes and compared uh, thrombotic complications in this group compared to the rest of the 264. And they showed no overall difference in the incidence of uh, thrombotic complications after intervention of the superficial system. And actually, if you look at the numbers, the absolute number of post thrombotic of uh, thrombotic complications was 7% versus 40%, 14%. So when looking at an algorithm in patients with multi-system, multi-level disease, um, so superficial and, uh, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on iliac obstruction for this uh, talk. Uh, the options are either treating the superficial system alone, uh, treating the obstruction, or both. Um, I think clinical presentation here is going to be the key uh, factor as far as uh, making a decision, and that's how I usually practice. And for, you know, as we all know, there's really no great data out there on how to really, uh, or any data really, on how to best treat these patients. So I think common sense and evaluation of um, what's going on both in the superficial and deep system is really all we have at this point. Um, we know that patients with combined multi-system, multi multi-level disease though, do tend to have worse clinical uh, outcomes and, and present uh, worse. So these are usually patients with C4 and C6 disease, or they have significant pain in the extremity or venous claudication. Um, one of the few papers looking at combined disease is obviously from uh, over a decade ago, or close to two decades now, from Peter and Raju, um, where they treated both superficial and iliac system. Uh, and this was, uh, um, as you can see, the almost all of the patients were C4, 5, and 6 uh, stage, so advanced disease. Uh, and hemodynamically, these patients, after intervention, uh, significantly improved, and clinically, there was improvement. Uh, also, healing rate, 68%, you know, most studies, if you look at also healings, um, you know, treating the saphenous, probably you can get close to that uh, um, number. They did not look at also recurrence. Uh, so treatment algorithm really, again, in multi-level, multi-system disease, um, you would think that and argue, some people may argue it to treat the pivotal segment um, or the one that's affected the most. But unfortunately, it's impossible to really identify what that pivotal segment as we cannot uh, quantify segmental reflux or obstruction or the severity of those. Uh, hemodynamically at this point. Now it's presumptive to expect that complete symptom relief uh, should be obtained in patients with multi-level disease when you only treat one segment. Uh, therefore, you would expect potentially that partial treatment would re result in, in partial relief of symptoms. Therefore, multiple interventions may lead to better outcomes. Now, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I rely heavily on clinical presentation, imaging, findings on what we've been talking about as far as distribution of disease, whether it's uh, reflux in the pelvis, reflux in the superficial obstruction, and we've been talking about different calcification systems all day today. Uh, but really, it's clinical presentation that, that drives intervention. Um, now, patients with C2 disease, you know, I typically just treat their superficial system. Uh, there's really, um, when they if they have a nibble and they're only presenting with C2 disease with classic superficial symptoms, uh, there's really no intervention of the iliac 
that I can find is warranted, unless they're presenting with claudication, venous claudication. Now, C3 disease, again, is, is, is the very challenging uh, as far as decision making. Because of this long differential diagnosis list of patients with C3 disease, as well as when you look at outcomes of interventions in these patients, only about 50% to 60% of them, even in Peter's pa uh, paper uh, where they treated both the superficial and the deep, did they have improvement of their swelling. So it's really the C4, 5, and 6 group that, that is, is the one that you have to kind of decide how to intervene in these patients. Um, when, you, when, I, when I talk about severity of disease, so, you know, how much reflux and obstruction, as I mentioned, there's really no tool to really quantify this. Um, but, you know, common sense, you know, you have a four or five millimeter saphenous vein in a patient with an ulcer and an iliac obstruction, you know, chances are it's not that five millimeter vein that needs to be addressed first, and it's rather the obstruction. Similarly, if you have a 10, 12 millimeter saphenous with reflux and a 50% iliac compression, that patient, again, from a clinical perspective, probably benefit the most for treating their staph in the system. So how to really approach patients with deep disease? Uh, this is kind of a long kind of algorithm, but I'll try to go through it quickly. Uh, if they have reflux in the superficial and deep system, really not much, a lot of uh, options for deep reflux. I know there's a bunch of companies looking at interventions for cutaneous, or you could do surgical valve uh, um, repair or uh, transplantation, or transplantation, uh, but those have not really gone on the wayside, and I kind of just concentrate on fixing their superficial reflux uh, in its entirety, including the peri ulcer venous network. In patients with uh, reflux and a nivel lesion, well, if they're presenting with C3 uh, disease, you want to really heavily work on excluding other causes uh, of their leg swelling. Uh, look at the severity of their reflux. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, as far as what is the size of the vein, the, the distribution of reflux, um, as well as their nivel lesion. And I tend to use a higher percentage as far as stenosis if I am going to treat a nivel lesion. So, you know, the video trial looked at, you know, reported that 60% is a better uh, marker than 50%. Uh, I even go higher at 80% as far as a, uh, uh, for the C3 patient. Uh, so I'll fix their superficial system, and if they do not improve and I can't rule out any other causes, then I'll consider treating their, their nivel lesion. The C4 through 6 group, I think, is the slam dunk uh, from as far as, you know, license to intervene and in treating both the superficial and deep system. But again, there is no data to, to randomize as far as looking in this subgroup of patients, um, you know, just treating the superficial or just compression or treating both as far as what group, uh, which intervention is better. Uh, but I think if you have a patient with an ulcer and you treat their superficial and they don't heal and you treat their, their, their iliac lesion, uh, is not unreasonable. Venous claudication, again, as long as you, um, from a clinical perspective, identify it correctly and, and are convinced that they have venous claudication, then uh, intervening and stenting their iliac lesion. How about patients with um, uh, superficial reflux and obstruction of their iliac system, as well as potentially their femoropathic system? So C3, again, this is the group that I'm always kind of leery of intervening. Um, and patient education is very important, both whether they have a nibble or an obstructive lesion, as far as uh, indicating to them that you know outcomes and re resolution of their swelling uh, may not uh, resolve. Although I do tell them that if they're having significant discomfort and pain in the leg, that will usually does improve. It's the swelling because of the long-standing disease, and now they probably have a, a, a component of flebal lymphedema, and that lymphatic system is cannot you know uh, recover. So in this group, again, fixing their superficial system and or iliac stenting for the C4-6. I think again, um, not too many people would argue uh, with fixing both. And potentially, if they have, especially with ulcer patients, I'll go in, if they haven't healed after their intervention of their superficial and iliac, I'll even treat their femoral popliteal with angioplasty. Uh, and then the last group, again, venous claudication, stenting this group is, is very reasonable. Um, this is a typical patient, to finish up with a case, uh, eight millimeter saphenous, common iliac vein occlusion on, on, uh, on ultrasound. Uh, this is their uh, venogram. Um, huge collaterals, and uh, I don't think anybody would argue that treating this uh, with stenting, 
especially in the setting of a venous ulcer is unreasonable. Uh, so we proceeded to uh, intervene and open up their iliac system, and then uh, after that treated their esophagus vein. With that, I'd like to uh, conclude my presentation and invite everybody in March uh, to the American Venus Forum, of course, virtually. I uh, hope to see everybody there. Thank you, Lowell and Dr. Sutherland. Uh, Tony, thank you very much. Very, uh, very important, very important question. Um, we have uh, two discussants. Uh, did I blow you out all the way? Uh, no, you didn't. I think. <laughs> Evgeny, we can't oh. hear you. <laughs> so, uh, Tony, uh, with that being yeah. said, um, I will introduce the discussants. Um, uh, Professor Black from the United Kingdom will do the the lead off. Stephen, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Evgeny. As always, it's a great pleasure and honor to be part of your meetings and uh, this enormously um, knowledgeable faculty. Uh, Tony, it was a fantastic talk as always. You uh, you summarize a very complex uh, decision making process in a very uh, succinct and uh, sensible way. I guess my question to you is, the thing we struggle with this heterogeneous patient group is making sense of the hemodynamics. And you know, do you see anything coming or any additional thing we can add to that algorithm that makes a decision based on either uh, hemodynamic aspects or flow aspects that help us to determine what the most important thing is? Because at the moment, it's it's based on, a, on, on an imaging yeah. study. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's something that we're struggling, all of us in, in the venous system, right? Whether it's patients with just isolated superficial reflux or nevo lesions or, or in this group, which is combined. And again, these patients make it even more complex because it's not just their venous pathology. They now have, because of longstanding venous hypertension, they have compensate, you know, they have compromised lymphatic system. Uh, usually this group of patients are not very active, so they tend to be overweight. They have the dysfunction of the calf muscle pump. So there are multiple factors that can contribute to, to their underlying symptoms and clinical signs, which makes it very challenging that even if we had a tool to measure venous pressures or flow dynamics, you know, there's other things that potentially can be contributing to this. So I think, you know, unfortunately, and this is what I love about the venous system, it's, it's I, it's a lot of common sense or, or practical stuff mm. to kind of figure this out. Um, and in this advanced the group of, of patients, it's it's a very, I, don't, I cannot see anything and I don't know of anything in the near future that, that's going to help uh, as far as decision making. Thank you, Tony. Professor Shadikoff, are uh, you what connection? verbal now? No, you're yeah. not. Yeah. So I will go ahead and introduce uh, the next uh, discussant, which is Carlos uh, Simpkin from Argentina. Carlos? Hello, everybody. Thank you, Professor Shadikoff, and Lowell, of course, for the invitation. I loved your talk, Tony. Very didactic. The, my question is, uh, what is the situation in the reflux? When you talk about the no ablation at all, these patients, it's very important to discriminate what is the etiology of the, of the varices. What do you do in the discharge uh, indications in that patient? You, you do not perform ablation, you do not put an stent. Is that correct? What do you do in that cases? No, I think, I think uh, in these patients, if there's mixed disease, um, Treating the superficial system is always part of the treatment algorithm. Uh, the question is, when do you intervene on the on the iliac system? And that's kind of how I break it down. I don't think there's very few situations that I would not intervene on the superficial system. Let's say somebody with a post-robotic um, iliac obstruction and venous claudication. Um, I would probably just treat their iliac and then see you know how they do. Um, if their symptoms resolve completely, I wouldn't necessarily treat a six millimeter reflux in saphenous, unless they have, again, venous ulcer or pigmentation or anything like that. But if they're just venous claudication, 
in that group, I don't think you have to attack the safinismine uh, as a first, you know, treatment. So the best treatment is the clinical surveillance of that kind of patient, right? Yeah, I mean, the patient's gonna tell you what, what you need to do. If we just rely on, on imaging, then we'd be, you know, of course, half the patients, that, half the women with two kids will have pelvic varices. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that interesting uh, presentation and discussion. Now I'm going to get into a, a subject. We, we hear about all sorts of new guidelines, but I think one of the things that's really important is how do you achieve adoption of national guidelines in a country with NHS, National Health Service, and or a country with commercial insurance? And Alan, Professor Alan Davies will, from the UK will be talking about that. And I'd be interested to hear the discussions to follow. Alan, we're not hearing you. You should be able to hear me now. We can. Well, my apologies about that. What I'd very much like to do is just highlight to people as to what is a guideline, that really a guideline is never mandatory, but it's meant really very much to streamline clinical practice and hopefully make options more predictable and of a higher quality. The question is, for whose benefit are we looking at guidelines? Is it actually for the doctors, either the insurers or the taxpayers who are paying for the health care, the patient or for legal protection? And I think it's very important that you all consider these particular options. Furthermore, who should create guidelines? Should it be societies? Well, societies have clinicians who may undoubtedly have potential biases. Should it be a governmental organization like NICE, where you have independent practitioners and researchers looking at it, or should it be industry? And I would like to highlight very much to you that there are actually a large number of stakeholders who should be involved, and very importantly, the patient should be central to this, and also other clinicians who are non-specialists, because they may be responsible referring patients to us. And just to give you an example, the Average NICE guidance costs over $600,000 to actually develop. And this is just to give you an idea of the amount of money that is spent in the UK and the US per head on the development of national guidelines. Now, the important thing, you can have as many guidelines as you want, but unless you can get them implemented, it's not really much benefit. Now, what is interesting is the national VTE program in the UK and a similar one in the US very much saw the questions about VTE prophylaxis raised in 2005, went through an, a nice recommendations, then a recommendations by the Department of Health, then this concept of sequins, which I'll talk to you about a little bit more, where there is some reward for the healthcare professionals or the institution in actually following the guideline. We're all well aware of seeing patients with leg ulcers, but of all the national and international guidelines that are out there, only four of them are actually of good enough quality to actually be used as guidance if you are to look at the agreed protocol. If you look in the United Kingdom, for example, there has been lots and lots of work done on the management of venous leg ulcers, and the important thing is everybody in the well-known national, international study is that of the ESCAR trial showing that there was a benefit with respect to recurrence and intervention and the management of patients with leg ulcers. We all know that there's a level 2C recommendation with respect to healing from the SVS. But what is interesting, if you look at their guidelines, there is no 1A recommendation with respect to intervention for the management of leg ulceration. If we look at the NICE guidance with respect to re the recommendations for referral, it's very clear that patients with leg ulcers or heel leg ulcers should be referred to a team of healthcare professionals who can offer the full gamut of treatment. 
You are all well aware now of the results of the Everett trial that has shown not only that there is a benefit with respect to recurrence, but there is now very clearly a benefit with respect to leg ulcer healing. And basically it is a cost effective strategy to offer early intervention for those patients who have incompetent superficial veins to get their leg ulcers treated. Therefore, there needs to be a major review of leg ulcer pathways nationally and internationally. In the UK, this has led to the Royal Society of Medicine producing a potential pathway to get patients from the time of diagnosis all the way through from primary care to secondary care and have their treatment within two weeks, similarly to patients with cancer. This has been promoted by our National Wound Care Safety Program and has also, with respect to implementation, led to a sequin being developed. But this has unfortunately been put on hold this year for implementation with respect to COVID. But one of the key drivers is that we've also had political support from our all parliamentary group. If we then want to look at varicose veins, we are all well aware that there are many, many, many national and international guidelines that are out there. But only one of them actually meets all the agreed, agreed scoring system for actually being a good guideline. And the main reason is that many of the guidelines that we use do not have stakeholder involvement and do not really evaluate applicability. And this is very important when we are trying to convince national public health doctors to, and others and payors to endorse guidelines. We all know that the European, the NICE and the SVS guidelines have very much a similar clinical assessment, investigation and treatment hierarchy that they actually live with. But only NICE looks at cost. If we look at the NICE guidance with respect to the hierarchy of treatment, we have been able to show in the UK now from our national statistics that it is now followed very clearly that the NICE guidance is being followed. If we then look again at referral, which I've talked to you a little bit about earlier, if we look at the evidence that's been accumulated since the guidance came out, there's been no change in referral patterns with respect to patients with C6 disease, but there has been overall an increased referral of patients with CT to C5 disease and an increased use of endothermal ablation. Now in the United Kingdom, the payors are clinical groupings which are known as clinical commissioning groups. And you can see here by this in red, those are the groups that are not following the NICE guidance. And this work was done by Dan Caradice and colleagues, but basically showed that the people, the payers are not following the guidance. And it is all due to lack of resource. But what the Department of Health has done, and it, when it initially came out, it was thought to be a negative. They looked at 17 procedures that were deemed to be of limited value. But the one thing that they did do, they fully endorsed the NICE guidance and said that this should be fully adopted between all of the clinical commissioning groups. And what is interesting, we were looking to have in October and November, the one year results of an audit as to see what had happened. But unfortunately, COVID struck. Then if we look at international guidance that are out there by various societies, I would like you just to think that this may actually be a very generous guidance when you look at the gradings. We know in the United States, there's a very similar process to NICE in, in many respects looking at Medicare, but all the great and the good were looking, involved in these guidelines. And as I gather, this was a one stroke two day meeting. But what was the upshot of this? Basically, there was no evidence to confirm or refute the use of duplex ultrasound to confirm chronic venous disease or for planning invasive treatments. And I think we'd all find that very hard to understand. Also, it, what is interesting to note is that they also fully endorsed the NICE guidance with respect to the treatment hierarchy. It's also interesting to note that actually in the United States, there's no good data on the cost effectiveness of venous treatment, even though that is something that is mandated by AHRQ. If we look, and this is a, an, a very much an American slide, but it could apply to anyone. There are many, many payors who are involved. 
And if we want to get guidelines implemented, it, it's important that we as clinicians actually infiltrate the payors to make sure that they're well aware of the clinical evidence for intervention. So basically to summarize, it's firstly important that we all accept that the treatment that we want to offer is a clinically effective treatment. Yes, it is important that it is cost effective. We then want to be able to ensure that we can influence public health doctors who influence payors and those who are going to distribute healthcare. You also want to get the public involved to be demanding of treatment. And as I've shown you with our leg ulcer guidance, but once you've got politicians involved, it undoubtedly opens up doors. It's also key to keep on educating healthcare professionals who may refer patients so they do not carry on work working in the mode that they would if they, as if they were still at medical school. Many people would regard healthcare as a human right. We have to remember, however, that the, there is a limited amount of money that can be spent on the whole health care cake and divide it up. And we have to remember as phlebologists that we are very little fish swimming in a very large pond. So I'd very much like to suggest to you it's about spending money wisely and to get the best value for money for our patients. And I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all. And I wish you all a very merry and blessed Christmas. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Alan. Uh, fantastic presentation. And um, Loyal, uh, do we have our discutants, Kiss and uh, Jansson? Yes, we do. We have um, uh, Stephen, unfortunately, case witness could not join us today. And <clears throat> Steve Black uh, mm -hmm. uh, filled in at the last moment, uh, gracious. And if he's here, would he comment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Jenny, again. Um, uh, Alan, it's a, a great summary of, of guidance and, and, uh, and, and the trouble that we followed. Do you think in some respects, it's a failure of clinicians to engage appropriately in, in understanding that pathway and process so that we, we don't generate the evidence that the guideline writing committees need to make appropriate decisions for us and then get surprised when we find the treatments we really like being um, thwarted, so to speak. I, I th Steve, I'd, I'd completely agree with you. I, I think the, the one thing that we don't really, as clinicians, concentrate on very clearly is the, is the pathway. And if you look at most of the guidelines that have been produced, they are very much technical documents that only a specialist would look at. And I just don't think we've got the, inverted commas, advertising right to get the word out there, call it education if you want to, to actually people, there are lots of things that can be done for this patient group. And I think we very much need to focus and put it crudely to be advertising what we can do to help people. And I don't think we're very good at that. So I guess I'd follow on from that. As you know, the in, in the UK, we've got now buy-in from the parliament and, and very high level support from the government. And, and some of that stemmed from a few members of parliament suffering from leg ulcers and suddenly realizing just how bad the damn thing is. So um, it, it, it seems that we almost have to inflict the disease upon the, the decision makers for them to understand where we're going. How do you think we can engage patients in being better lobbyists for, for changing a policy? Well, I, 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 th I think, Steve, the answer probably is that in the UK, pac patients are probably much more reserved than they are in various other parts of the world. But I, but I think it is a very important point. And I think one of the things that we're limited in the UK because of various GMC regulations, that you can't advertise much about disease processes, certainly commercially on the t TV or et cetera. But again, I think, as you know, we have something groups like the Leg Matters group, but they do, we don't somehow seem to be able to get the message out to Mr. and Mrs. Average who are out there suffering. And I, and I think... We've obviously all tried the national press and you, you, we get patients refer, ref, referred if there's an article in something called our Daily Mail, you'll suddenly see a spike in um, 
pa patients being referred. But I, I think it's something that we really need to get the message out there. But I, I also think at a more local ba basis, we, 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 we're not good at li liaising with our GPs or primary hair care doctors who are still locked in what they learned at medical school and have a slightly different perception. And to be fair, it must be very hard for them to keep updated with everything. I, I'm not knocking them, but I, I just think we need to think that. But I think that my, my key thing, and if there's one take home message I would give, I think any guideline worth its salt should be on one page. Mm. Have, and that's a bit like the UK Venus Forum. And I hope in various ways that I might be able to influence people that, a bit like the American guidelines, we just want one page, of, one page of guidelines so they can go to people and patients will understand and our medical colleagues who are not experts will also understand. Thank you. Um, I, think, I think you need you. a TikTok Steve. video, basically. Thank you, Stephen. I, I just got to move on and I appreciate your, your comments. Is uh, Dr. Jinsan Wang with us? I did not see her. Maybe she had difficulty uh, connecting. With that in mind, I'm going to move right on for lack of time, and I'm going to invite uh, Professor uh, Kersat Bosker, who is leading the charge for the 2022 um, World UIP Congress, and he's going to present European College of Phlebology Guidelines for Truncal Ablation. Hello, everyone. Evgeny and Lowell, thanks for the wonderful invitation. This is a picture taken last year in a wonderful hotel in St. Petersburg. Can you see the smiling faces here? <laughs> wonderful, isn't it? Now we are at home, unfortunately, and we are making the meeting here. But I wish to be again next year in there and have a wonderful time with you in this wonderful atmosphere coming from maybe 200 years. Right, European College of Phlebology guideline published beginning of this year. It is a work uh, we had together with Martin Aves, uh, Danielson, Lazaris, Pavlovich, Sorin Abario, and Lars Rasmussen. Believe me, it took one and a half years to uh, finish this guideline. I didn't know how difficult was this job, but you know, I understood very nicely. Right. What about the recommendations we had in this uh, guideline? First of all, for the non-complicated C2, C3 workers' veins, surgical treatment is recommended instead of conservative management. In some patients, definitely conservative management might be, but, you know, in certain patients, this patient definitely needs some sort of treatment. And high negation is not... Uh, anymore should be done, and instead high ligation and stripping is recommended at the uh, class 1A recommendation level. When I started my surgical training a couple of years, uh, 20 to 25 years ago, we used to the high ligation in order to prevent, uh, preserve the venous and magna, but, you know, unfortunately, almost 50, 60% of the patients did come again with recurrences, and we are not doing any more. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we liked to address uh, the, the current results of the different ablation methods. If you see uh, three years follow-up results, uh, radio, frequency fresh, uh, radio frequency, laser, uh, have almost the same uh, closure results. And MOCA was also 87% uh, uh, closure rates, and cyanoclad glue has 94% occlusion rates. When we are writing this paper, uh, five years data were not available for uh, MOCA and glue. But at that time, uh, the Thalman methods had five years data, and as you can see here, very high, very satisfactory closure rates. Right, for the saphenous vein, for the great saphenous vein, and for the short saphenous vein, definitely and definitely, we do uh, suggest uh, laser or radiofrequency uh, for the treatment. Yes, laser and radiofrequency techniques are superior to 
surgery or form security therapy, class 1A level. For the short saphenous vein, a laser or radiofrequency techniques are recommended in preference to surgery or form, and the suggestion level is 2A. We do suggest 2AB, new modified fibers, such as jacket tip or radial fiber. The results of dead fibers are better than the uh, previous ones. Steam ablation can be used, but unfortunately, steam ablation has a very limited usage in the uh, phileology area. Two, three, maybe five good reports are available, but unfortunately, the data is not enough. For the treatment of uh, incompetent anterior saphenous, uh, access, anterior accessory saphenous vein, we do suggest laser radiofrequency or form for the treatment. The suggestion level is 2C. I know in the current uh, AVF guideline uh, for the treatment of uh, superior uh, uh, great saphenous vein re reflux with uh, anterior accessory saphenous vein reflux, both of them should be treated in the same session. Uh, you may ask me why I did put this beautiful lady in this picture. No. The, the reason is, new things is always very sexy. New things is always very exciting. But uh, still, the new techniques are not as good as endothermal techniques. If we start with mocha, we can say to be a level of suggestion. Still, we don't have enough data showing better results or as good as thermal ablation results. For example, after this publication, we have the new data from Holland and uh, five years data are available. The closure rate is 78.7%. And five of the patients needed re-entire. That's why still we cannot say uh, the MOCA is as good as endothermal techniques. Regarding the glue, we suggested two AA level. At the time of the writing of this paper, five years data of uh, glue data was not available, but recently uh, Morrison reported the five years data, and the closure rate for glue is 91.5% and for radiofrequency 85.2%. Definitely, these results are as good as thermal techniques. But there are some ongoing discussions regarding glue, first of all, hypersensitivity reactions, neuronal formation. So still, it's hard to say, uh, to suggest glue 1A suggestion for the treatment of uh, venous insufficiency. The other important issue is, in a recent paper published from Singapore, uh, the stump length was 3.3 centimeters for saphenofemoral junction and 2.7 centimeters for saphenofemoral junction. So there's a big gap there, and I don't know how important will be this uh, long stump for the future of recurrences. And uh, so certainly for the treatment of saphenous reflux, surgery is an alternative method to endovenous ablation. This is a big question, this is a big discussion. Should we treat the side branches together or not? In our, in our paper, we suggested, because of the data enough data, we suggested concomitant treatment of both uh, them together with one A, but I know there is a big discussion about that, and thromboflaxy should be considered for the high risk patients to be C. Routine direct uh, ultrasonography is not recommended, and in order to reduce pain and then compression is recommended for a week in our guideline. These are all uh, can be discussed. And finally, uh, I have to admit we had to postpone uh, UIP to 2022 because of the ongoing problems, and uh, we were planning uh, to organize 2020 ESUS meeting in Istanbul, but unfortunately this also has to be postponed to 2025 and see you all in UIP in Istanbul in 2022. And thanks a lot uh, for listening to me. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kursat. 
Please, uh, our discussants, uh, my pleasure to um, invite uh, Sergei Belenzov from uh, Yekaterinburg from Russia. The first question. Dear Boss Kurt, uh, do you think glue will replace thermoablation in future? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, uh, at the beginning, uh, glue for us was very enthusiastic, was looking a wonderful technique. But after that, we started to have some granuloma cases. Not in our country. I haven't seen any granuloma formation so far in with using Turkish glue. But certainly, in 70 to 80 percent of the patients, we will still continue to use thermal techniques. It might be laser or radiofrequency, not uh, steam. Glue will have a special role in some small veins, in some special cases, but the standard treatment at that moment is looking at thermal techniques. A glue has a 20-30% role uh, for the chronic medicine insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kursat. And uh, the second question from uh, Victor Kanata, uh, Vice President of Union International of Lebology from Paraguay. Victor, please. Thanks, Edeko, for letting me speak today. Thanks to Lowell, too. Was, it's a great meeting already. Um, Kursat, I have just a question for you. The meeting is excellent, and your talk was excellent, too. Um, my question is, when you decide to um, in, use the glue, do you ever test for allergic reaction for your patient? No, it's not available in my country. And I don't think it's available somewhere in the world uh, at that moment. We are just uh, getting a history from the patient. If there is a question of allergy to glue, for example, they may use it for the nails. Uh, for me, they may use it for the skin creation. Yes, we are not using. But um, unfortunately, there is no routine uh, skin text we can use for glue. No, we are not using. But interestingly, Thank you. interestingly, I mean, Great. it's not, uh, it's rare. Thank you very much. And we'll proceed on. And thank you for. Uh, the interesting presentation and the discussants. We're going to continue on with venous truncal ablation evidence-based by Professor Armando Mancia, who needs no introduction. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, Laul. Thank you, Evgeny, for this kind of invitation. It is always a presence, always a, a pleasure to be present in your meeting. Of course, I would, I would prefer to be uh, in St. Petersburg as uh, in the past. Uh, hopefully this will happen in the near future. Let me share uh, my screen um, now with my pre-recorded talk. It is my great pleasure to present in the next few minutes the new published European Venus Forum guidelines on varicose veins with the endorsement of the International Union of Angiology and the International Union of Phlebology. I don't have any disclosures for this specific presentation. The first important point to consider uh, it is that uh, we know and uh, you can see here in these uh, different pictures, we know that uh, the varicose veins are different from patient to patient. And we must be aware of this to define and to choose for each specific patient the best intervention technique to satisfy the, the individual pattern of each one. When talking about uh, uh, 
the different the different intervention options, uh, it, it is important to to know that they should be based on the evidence, on the published evidence, that's for sure, but also on the specific skills of the special specialist for each interventional technique, um, and also consider the importance of the national healthcare system reimbursement policies, the patient's ability to pay for a treatment that is not reimbursed, and of course, we must always take into account the patient's preference. And uh, the indications for invasive treatments based on uh, the clinical status of the patient and uh, the ultrasound investigation are to relieve symptoms and improve the quality of life, to prevent acute complications, to prevent the progression of the disease, and last but not least, to satisfy cosmetic reasons. During the past uh, years, the development of minimally invasive techniques to operate varicose veins in patients with chronic venous disease of the lower limbs has provided a patient-friendly means to treat uh, this disorder as an office-based procedure, including today the modern open surgery that can be performed under local anesthesia as an outpatient procedure based on pre-operative assessment and mapping using duplex ultrasound. At the latest uh, European Venus Forum guidelines that were just published in June in the International Angiology Journal, uh, you can read that uh, these different interventional techniques were considered according to the strength of recommendation and the level of evidence as having uh, 1A for modern open surgery, 1A for thermal ablation with laser or radiofrequency, 1A for ultrasound guided from sclerotherapy, 1B for blue, for steam, and for mocha. When choosing between these different intervention modalities, all of us must always take into, take into account the mechanism of action and limitations of the technique, the operator skills that are require, required, and because of this, most of the new procedures that are operator dependent, and when two or more of these are tested, in a randomized control trial, it is important that the investigation, investigators are well trained in all of them. It is also important to consider in this equation the mid and long term results and the reimbursement policies of each specific country and cost effectiveness of the technique. In terms of cost effectiveness and having this level 1A of evidence for different techniques, we should read what was published in the systematic review and meta analysis, saying then that when the differences between treatments are so negligible in terms of clinical outcomes, the treatment with the lowest costs should be considered the most cost effective. As my final remarks, uh, and according to these uh, EVF guidelines, 
We can read from the several uh, references that were considered that accurate analysis of conventional randomized controlled trials is difficult as hidden bias can be sometimes hard to identify. An alternative uh, to uh, combat this uh, difficulty are expertise-based randomized controlled trials where participants are randomized to clinicians with expertise in uh, intervention A or clinicians with expertise in intervention B and the clinicians perform only the procedure they are experts in. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Armanda. Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. And we have uh, two discutants, Alexander Flor uh, from Austria, the first one. Alexander. Uh, hello, Evgenia. Hello, uh, Lowell. Thank you very much for the invitation. The last time we met personally we were at the swimming pool in Mumbai in January. So it was a fantastic time. So I hope we'll meet personally again and dancing around at the swimming pool. Amanda, muito obrigado pela sua palestra. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. I want to ask you, you uh, showed us the different techniques. What's your personal option now for a patient C3, varicosity, uh, greater sophena vein with one centimeter with reflux, uh, which technique would you use? Dankeschön, Alexander. Uh, thank you for your kind uh, um, comments. Um, Usually in my daily practice, um, I'm, I'm using more than one technique. Um, I'm using um, uh, this modern open surgery, ready frequency, and, ultra, uh, and also the ultrasound guided from sclerotherapy. So um, what, what makes the difference in my choice, it is related with uh, the patient, the expectations of the patient, the age of the patient, the cosmetic appearance and what the, they expect from us, the, um, the, the anatomical pattern and, uh, as you know, uh, even having reflex uh, and varicose veins related with the great saphenous veins, they are not always the same. So. You, you can you can have more or less superficial uh, with more or less easy to navigate when you try to cannulate it if you are trying to manage with one or another technique. So I, I cannot say to you that I have only one choice and only one preference. I, I'm I'm using and not only me but also my team because we have to 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 to, to work in a team and and if for um, one specific patients I prefer this technique and if I'm not the expert in this technique someone from my department should should manage the patient with the, with the, with the, the intervention choice that we have. Did I answer to to your question, Alexander? Yeah, it's okay for me. Yeah? Muito obrigado, Armando. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Pasiba, um, Evgenie. Thank you, Lowell. Pasiba. Uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Paola Ortiz from Uruguay. Please, Paola. Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So thank you very much, Dr. Kavnik and Dr. Shaidakov, for the invitation. This year has been very difficult for all of us. So but still we have the opportunity to meet in this way. So thank you for the opportunity to join you today and hope to see you all next year in person. So excellent presentation, Dr. Masila. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Um, we perform a lot of um, non-thermal tumors and ablation in our humanitarian and academic activities in Central America, um, but mainly to the great saphenous vein. So I would like to know what is your opinion uh, about, the, for example, an intersaphenous vein treating with a non-thermal tumescent ablation and also the small saphenous vein. It's also 1B, the recommendation. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for your uh, kind uh, question. Um, if I correctly understood your point, uh, that's why in one of my slides you you you, you can read that uh, in uh, our decision um, we should always take into account also uh, the reimbursement policies of the country uh, because. Uh, some of these techniques uh, are more ex expensive than the others and uh, at the end we can obtain uh, the same uh, out the cl same clinical outcomes and so especially in these humanitarian projects where um, we have some constraints we get re related with uh, with the funds we should uh, uh, choose uh, the best uh, uh, technique that can be cheaper with the same clinical uh, outcomes. And for example, as you mentioned, for this intersaphenous vein or even for small saphenous vein, uh, you can perform all of this uh, mapping uh, with, with, with ultrasound mapping with uh, uh, local anesthesia and small phlebectomies. Uh, and, and this is much more cheaper or if you or if you have, if you are, if you have a special expertise in using the the foam sclerotherapy, you can you can obtain exactly the same clinical uh, outcome. Yes, thank you. I agree. We yes, we have uh, we are lucky because we have a lot of donations catheters in some of our uh, academic activities. So we perform more than a hundred mocha and also glue, but mostly to the gray saphenous vein. That's why I have some concerns about doing glue uh, to the small saphenous vein, for example. I'm concerned about the, the glue heat um, and the small saphenous vein. But also, uh, we have noticed uh, excellent re results with the foam. We, we perform a lot of foam to the small saphenous vein and to the gray saphenous vein with an excellent result. But of course, all the new armamentum we have now you know, we have better results at the end and long, long term results. But thank you for, for your answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paula. Let, let me just make one extra comment um, that uh, even having um, sometimes these constraints and related with uh, the reimbursement policy of each specific country, we uh, as um, uh, clinicians, uh, uh, and also researchers, we should not uh, avoid uh, the, uh, the importance and the, the development of these new technologies. And for example, in these uh, latest guidelines, the, the, great, uh, the level of evidence uh, for uh, glue is not so high as it is for radio frequency or for uh, modern open sessions, just because of the criteria. And at that time, the number of um, high quality randomized controlled trials do not allow us to give a higher uh, level um, of evidence for, for glue. But um, glue is another technique that we, we have to consider that in this uh, session, we already had the discussion about three different kinds of glue and, it is, and this is amazing. So thank you, Armando, and thank you, Paola. Uh, I'm now going to move on to our last uh, presentation before our, our summary by Professor Golvisky, but this is an exciting topic. Uh, HIFU is a new modality, high intensity frequency ultrasound. And uh, Professor Strajak, who is now involved in HIFU, uh, is gonna talk about what do you know and is it ready for all to use? So, Professor Strajak, the floor is yours. Now I'm here. I just share the screen screen with you. Perfect. Yeah, is it? You Maybe. haven't shared the screen, but I can hear you. That's good, but I try to share the screen. Uh, oh, it's we are approaching it. Do you see the presentation? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. 
As we all Czech people speak a little Russian, so I would like to thank Yevgeny in Russian. Хочу поблагодарить Евгения за приглашение. Большое спасибо, Евгений. И поздравить с отличным вебинаром. This is my Russian greeting to Evgeny special. And uh, I'm very happy to be with you here. And I would like to speak, unfortunately, in seven minutes, but I will do my best to not to be late, not to be over time, about echotherapy of varicose veins. So let me know. Firstly, the terminology, because it's something new. What is HIFU? HIFU is high intensity focused ultrasound. What is echotherapy? This is therapeutic procedures using HIFU. Uh, what is VTU? This is one important part of the device, which is called Sonovane, which is called visualization and treatment unit. There is a mistake in treatment. In Sonovane, what is Sonovane? This is the device developed for the treatment of varicose veins using HIFU. For example, this is a device for echotherapy of varicose veins. Uh, HIFU is a proven C mark on non-invasive method for two common pathologies. So that's to explain that the HIFU didn't start with the veins. It's uh, a correlation also to the radio frequency. The radio frequency started also as a method for treating of uh, tumors which could not be operated. The same here, the breast fibroadenoma and thyroid nodules has been firstly treated by HIFU. There are a lot of references about those where uh, many of those patients with, do, with, the un, um, with, with the tumors which could not be treated surgically have been uh, have been uh, treated with, uh, with the high food. So the sonovane, there are the sequential of uh, clinics which have started with the Sonovain. The first in the world was our comment for today, Alfred Obermeier from Austria. The second Sonovain has been placed in Whiteley Clinic in London. And the third one was placed in Prague, region in Czech Republic, in the Center for Dermatology and Geology, which, is, which I've, I've founded many years ago. Uh, this is the general view on, of the high Sonovain device. I was, uh, I was talking to you about the VTU device. This is the most important part. In this box is a generator of the uh, high, freak, high intensity ultrasound, which is coming through the separators to the visualization and treatment unit. Here is the touchscreen interface, which uh, you can lead every the procedures from it. So this is again, the top of the VTU unit. There is a, uh, focal heat deposition into the tissue. And there is also a high food transducer for, uh, for the treatment. And also there is also duplex ultrasound possibility to see what you are doing in the tissue. So Sonovan applies a sequential passes to, of high food to cover the target or vein selection to be treated. Ultrasound emitted by a spherical transducer is concentrated to a focal point. The high energy deposited of the focal point creates a rapid temperature rise to therapeutic levels. The temperature reaches tissue coagulation levels and uh, induces further tissue necrosis at the target, target site. You can see the increase of the temperature of uh, in the tissue of on the on the left uh, on the left side and on the right side you can see the influence on the tissue of the temperature. Uh, the apparatus is very clever, so he can uh, work between the 9.6 millimeters from the skin to the deep of 24 millimeters. Uh, the targeting of the energy is done with the specific to the specified venous structure. Is uh, you can see on 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 the on the screen. And when you, you can also switch from the B to the color mode to find the vein you would like to treat. The procedure has five steps, preparation, position of the VTU probe, vein targeting, sequential high flow delivery, and the end of the procedure. 
these are the pictures from our clinic. This is the final decision of treatment strategy of the patient, which has been, of course, uh, examined before and make a good uh, indication for the treatment. Here is the placement of the VTU uh, at the starting point of treatment. Usually perform mild to medicine anesthesia as the next step. Here you can see some pictures. This is the short saphenous vein closed with the hypoenergy. This is the great saphenous vein with full occlusion in the proximal part. This is the cockets perforated before and after the, uh, after the echotherapy is completely closed. You can see no reflux, no fluid. And uh, these are the protocols from our first patients, which we overgave to the center uh, to develop the methods based on our analogies. In conclusion, so far we have performed 52 sonovian treatments in patients with various findings of the veins of lower extremities. The first treatment days were always in the presence of terrorism technicians. We are also visited by Professor Whiteley and uh, Dr. Overmeyer. The learning curve after first 22 treatments was in preparation and operation of the device 95%, determination of suitable indication for HIFO 95%. Now, after 52, we feel that our learning curve has, has reached 100%. The effectiveness and outcome of the treatment is comparable to endovenous methods. Negative is the little complex and difficult training and the relative slowness of the process. But uh, the technicians are working on speeding on the process. What is not solved yet is the real price of performance of the patients. Uh, like thermal but if methods, we think that the echo therapy will continue to evolve. There is no doubt that both the device and the way it is used will improve rapidly with the rapidly growing clinical experience. Standards will be very soon created. In that absolutely non-invasive method, HIFO will bring new possibilities for the treatment of not only varices, but also like ulcers and other forms of manifestation of venous reflux disease. HIFO must be considered as another potential breakthrough technology in this field. And actually, I would like to thank you for their attention. And this is my actually view from the window. I'm sitting in my uh, mountain cottage on the German border. Uh, we don't have very high mountains. This is the Klinovets, which has 1,244 meters over the sea level. You can see there is a sea on the slopes, but our government did not allow to work for the lifts, so we can start at 18th of December, we hope. What we have done with my daughter is to take the car from this point to drive the road on the hill and to change each other in going on the slopes because the slopes are perfect and prepared. Thank you very much for your attention. I was very happy to be here with you. Uh, Yaroslav, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a real winter in uh, your city uh, before Christmas. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alfred Obermeier. Alfred Obermeier here. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Alfred, please, um, your question. Thank you to the organizers to, um, for this wonderful Congress and to invite me as a discussant. <laughs> it's a very, very big pleasure to uh, welcome the third man in the world using HiFu in the small HiFu family. Um, and as Kursat Butskut from Turkey showed us, Yaro presented it, presented it us to us, uh, one of the most beautiful young ladies nowadays. This method is brand new. We have no long-term results. And this method, um, we are in a learning curve and is growing and it is a charming, beautiful young lady. Thank you for this nice presentation, Yaro. Yes, um, thank you very much too, so, okay. Yeah. Thank you, and uh, question from Australia, Stefania Roberts. Stefania, hello. hello. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yep. Can, yeah, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, very well. Firstly, thank you very much from down under, from Australia, uh, um, to the organisers for inviting me, and uh, to Dr. Stregic for the beautiful presentation on this novel technique. I have three questions for you. Considering the current armamentarium that we have available for the treatment of varicose veins, in your experience, which is quite limited, where do you see a place for HIFU at the moment? That's number one. Two, it seems like a pretty big device. And I'd love to know what the cost of the HIFU device is and if there are any disposables. And three, it seems like it's using heat. I'm not quite sure about the side effects and complication profile and how it compares to the endothermal technologies or for that matter, surgery or ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Okay, it's clear. The questions are clear. Uh, I start with the last question. It's always <laughs> easier. So um, it's working in about 85 degrees of centigrade. But uh, what you can destroy is the skin. It's the first, uh, it's the first part of the body which is in contact with HIFU. But as you have seen, it's targeted, uh, targeted to the top of the of the powerful. Uh, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's just a small place where this 85. Uh, degrees of centigrade are reached. This is about one centimeter. Uh, this is uh, about one centimeter uh, square centimeter place. So, and the device has uh, uh, such a uh, computer aided things that you cannot destroy anything other than the structure which is on the top what you can see on the screen. So I think we didn't see any problems. What you can destroy is the soralis and the saphenous nerve. So you should be a little, um, we have, once we have a, a little destroyed one soralis, but as you, as you know, you have, you need to have a real very good ultrasound to see the nerves. You don't see them always, but when you don't see the nerves, you be very careful, careful in the location where the nerve is. But, uh, you know, in those 52 patients, we had about 17 short saphenous veins. And we have had just one irritation of the soralis. That's uh, very precise. To be, to be the. Uh, the second question was the price. <laughs> this is uh, a question which yeah. I cannot answer because this is the question, question of the producer. Okay. Uh, maybe if uh, Alfred can say something more, but I think he cannot say more than I'm doing now here. It's, uh, and the first, uh, uh, and the first question was, if I understood well, very, I ex expect the position of this procedure in the, uh, in the all possibilities which are actually uh, presented as the possibilities how to treat the varicose veins. I think that this young lady, when she will be adult, will be able to treat all the veins you can imagine. Okay. So I think uh, we are at the beginning of a not very large trip, but uh, in, in, in the dimensions of Australia, uh, we are maybe somewhere in the middle of Australia and to reach Sydney or Melbourne, well, it's a quite a long way. It depends how, if you fly, or if you use the can, or if, if, you, if you walk. <laughs> so we are still maybe walking, but uh, okay. the results we have uh, reached until now are very promising. That's Thank you very um, much. I appreciate the comments for lack of time. Stefania, I'm going to move on, and I appreciate that. No problem. Um, thank you to the discussants, uh, uh, Professor Obermeyer. Thank you for joining us. And it gives me great pleasure to have Professor Peter Glavisky do our honorary uh, wrap-up of the meeting. Professor Glavisky.
Boleh, yang boleh ke situ. Thank you very much, Professor Lowell. Uh, greetings from uh, the Mayo Clinic. It's a real pleasure to uh, uh, participate uh, at this uh, great session, and uh, I wish uh, I was there personally in uh, in St. Petersburg with all of you. Uh, I think this was uh, indeed a, a great session. I just would like to uh, spend a couple of minutes to. Uh, uh, summarize my take-home message from this. Certainly, Professor Shaidakov and uh, Dr. Kabnik, who organized it, achieved the goal, and uh, uh, we had a great presentation based on uh, uh, evidence-based information and standards, and uh, starting right away with uh, uh, Professor Lower's presentation, uh, the uh, uh, North American version of uh, his presentation will be published in January in the uh, uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders. Uh, please read it and study it. It is important that we use international um, unified standards for EHIT. This is our editor's choice paper. We heard an excellent presentation from Dr. Uloa about the use of drugs. Uh, as uh, Professor Lowell said in the United States, we are eager to learn we do not have FDA approved uh, drugs. Uh, Dr. Parsi's presentation was excellent and it really called attention to the importance of uh, rigorous follow-up of uh, our patients to see if we can identify the potential complications that may need our immediate attention. Dr. Kilnani uh, uh, told us about the... Uh, okay. so, yes? No, can you? All right. About the soon uh, uh, published guidelines in phlebology and JBS about the new pelvic uh, venous disorder classification. Told, told us about uh, uh, the classification, which really makes a lot of sense, and we are going to use it in this country as well. Uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, 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 Professor Gasper's simple and complicated uh, uh, version of the. Uh, uh, algorithm that we can use to uh, treat uh, combined superficial and venous disease. And uh, uh, Professor Davis told us that his guideline, the NICE guideline, is the only great guideline uh, because it looked into cost and that we should spend our money effectively. And Alan, we are going to spend our money effectively. And I'm looking forward to write the uh, much needed one page guideline. And then we learned about truncal ablations from uh, Professor Boscourt and the European guidelines uh, from uh, 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 Armando Mancilla. And then uh, finally, this exciting uh, new uh, technique uh, that was introduced to us. It's a uh, uh, um, uh, abbreviation I learned today, the high intensity focused ultrasound. So uh, what's the take home message? Chronic venous disease is a global problem. And what do we need? We need sessions like this. International uh, Venus Forum is going to uh, bring us a global solution because the evidence is global and um, uh, uh, we learn more when we listen to uh, uh, outcomes all around the world using the technique. Just one minute about uh, our journal that has obviously a lot of research that comes up with the global solution. The JVSVL is one of the four JVS journals currently uh, we are very pleased to have a, a truly international editorial board. And Professor Shaidakov, welcome to the uh, editorial board of the uh, uh, JVS uh, VL. The uh, uh, 
journal is international. You can see uh, that the United States, uh, China, and Turkey uh, uh, leads. And we were pleased to see that uh, the Russian papers are increasing in number two. Uh, the journal is doing quite well uh, during the very few years uh, of its existence. It has a prominent uh, impact factor. These are just some of the special features that we have, visual abstracts, monthly videos. Uh, we are present on social media at our website and listen to the JVSVL uh, podcasts. And uh, finally, two papers that were extremely important this year that you should all consult the update of the SEEP classification and reporting standards and the 2020 appropriate use criteria for chronic lower extremity venous disease. I would like to thank you again for inviting me, Professor Shaidakov. Bolshoye spasiba. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you very much. A great honor for me to be in the board of uh, Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venus and Lymphatic. Uh, I think a lot of uh, Russian publication will be in the nearest future. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues.